Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, The Importance of Prayer. This coming Thursday, May the 2nd, 2024, is the National Day of Prayer. So I would encourage each one of you to set aside just a little bit of time to pray for our country, to pray for the president, to pray for his advisors, and to pray for those who are making our laws. Also pray for the church, especially those who are suffering for the name of Jesus. Christians around the world are being persecuted for their beliefs every single day. And many of those are being killed for their belief in Jesus, that he is the savior. So let's pray for the persecuted church. That's all they ask for, that they be remembered in prayer, that we here in the West would hold them up in prayer. The following quote is found in Matthew Henry's commentary, and I quote, that man is a brute, is a monster that never prays, that never gives glory to his maker, nor feels his favor, nor owns his dependence upon him. One great design, therefore, of Christianity is to assist us in prayer, to enforce the duty upon us, to instruct us in it, and be encourage us to expect advantage by it." End of quote. There are huge advantages from prayer, and we'll try to cover some of those advantages in today's message, the importance of prayer. Let us turn, please, to our scripture reading found in Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 13. This is a parable that Jesus told his disciples after they came to him when he had just finished praying in a certain place and asked him to teach them how to pray. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 through 13. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Just before this, Jesus' disciples came to Him just after He had finished praying in a certain place, and they asked Him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught His disciples. In prayer, is only a conversation with God, then why would John have to teach his disciples how to talk to God? And why would Jesus' own disciples come to him and ask to be taught how to pray? Therefore, prayer has to be more than what we've relegated it to in mere conversation. After they had asked to be taught, Jesus goes right into saying, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. He was teaching them that prayer is a discipline. Not only is it a discipline, but it's another form of worship where we acknowledge the Father and revere his holy name. Yes, we bring our requests. Yes, we bring our petitions. Yes, we bring our supplications to God, but it is still an act of worship to our God. But at any rate, Jesus tells this parable about a man going to his friend's house at midnight and asked to borrow 
three loaves of bread. Now, that's a pretty specific number. Not one, not two, not even four, but three. I guess this guy believed in the old adage, go big or go home. So, I looked a little bit closer at this, and then I realized, hey, bread is indicative of healing. I want you to see, see this with me. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 through 30. And from there he arose and went away to a region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Did you notice what Jesus said? No, not that he called her a dog. He said, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She was not asking to be fed. She was not even asking for spiritual food. She was asking for healing for her little daughter. But yet Jesus said, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Again, it's not right to take the children's bread. But Jesus, I'm not asking for food. I'm not asking for bread. I'm asking for the healing of my daughter. But here's what we need to understand. When Jesus suffered and died for us, he purchased a threefold healing for us. One, spiritual. Two, psychological. And three, physical. I want you to turn with me, please, to the prophet Isaiah's writing. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. This is Isaiah's prophecy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This is Isaiah's prophecy concerning the then coming Messiah. The first two sentences says that he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. That statement is speaking about our spiritual healing. In other words, it's our salvation. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. This one has to do with our psychological healing, which includes demonic activity or even demonic possession. Jesus took the chastisement so that we don't have to suffer with anxiety or depression, panic attacks, or any other harassing spirit. We have psychological healing because that is one of the children's bread. The third and last loaf of bread is healing. By his stripes, we are healed. We have healing for our body. We don't have to suffer in sickness. Jesus paid it when he was whipped. The strike on his back, we have healing. Psalms 107 verse 20 says, He set up his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. This speaks of Jesus. Jesus is the word of God who became flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14. Jesus would later physically fulfill that scripture when he was scourged before being crucified. So whether it is 
physical sickness, spiritual sickness, or demonic possession, it is considered healing. And healing is the children's bread according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It belongs to us because Jesus purchased it for his bride, the church, his own body, and with his own blood. Therefore, each one of those loaves in the parable represents one of the three healings that Jesus purchased for us. Spiritual healing, psychological healing, and physical healing. Those are the three fold healings that Jesus purchased. We access our healing through prayer. Look at what Jesus told his disciples when he and Peter and James and John came down from off Mount, Mount Figuration and found the other nine disciples arguing with a crowd, disputing with them. A man had brought his son to have a demon cast out of him. But Jesus' nine disciples couldn't get the demon cast out. But when Jesus came down, he said, bring the boy here. And he cast out that demon with just the word. And those disciples, they were in great wonder. They, they, they were amazed and they came to Jesus privately and asked, why could we not cast it out, Lord? And this is Jesus' reply, Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. But I want you to notice that Jesus did not go away and pray. He didn't go away and fast. Why? Because he was already prayed up. He was already fasted up. Therefore, he didn't have to go and pray before he could cast his demonic spirit out. He was already prayed up and fasted up. His disciples were not praying. They were not fasting according to Matthew chapter 9 verse 14. But after the resurrection, after the giving of the Holy Spirit, after they were filled in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, his disciples prayed and fasted often and they were prayed up. Look at what Peter said in Acts chapter 6 verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to what? To prayer and to the ministry of the word. They were all prayed up. They were all fasted up. And look what the scripture says. And many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostle. Acts chapter 5 verse 12. It is very, very important to pray. That is one of the most important weapons that we have. And that's why Peter could say to the crippled man at the gate beautiful, Acts chapter 3 verse 6. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter knew what he had. Peter knew what Jesus had paid for. Peter knew what Jesus had given his church. Later in his first epistle, the first epistle of Peter, he would write this, speaking about the Lord Jesus. He said, by whose stripes you were healed. It's a done deal. Peter knew it. But you must pray. You must seek him. And you must believe. You got to have the faith. So if we seek the face of him who freely gives, he will, we will receive. Peter believed in a threefold ministry, as did Paul and all the early believers, all the early Christians, they believed in that threefold ministry. They all believed in the importance of prayer. They set aside a time for prayer. That's why Jesus said in the parable, Luke chapter 11, verse 9 and 10, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. 
and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. You ask through prayer. You receive through faith. You must ask, but you must also believe that what you ask, you can have. If you ask it in the name of Jesus, you will have it. I believe the key is continued prayer. And keep on asking until you receive the answer and do not give up. In other words, push. Pray until something happens. Jesus said in his parable that the man went to his friend at midnight. Midnight in scripture is a metaphor for the crescendo of some great and intense biblical event such as the midnight cry, meaning the point of time when Jesus returns to get his church. At midnight, the Lord went through Egypt and killed the firstborn of all of those who did not have the blood of the sacrifice painted on their doorposts and above on the doorframe. Paul and Silas were in prison, worshiping, singing hymns to God. And while the other prisoners were, were listening, Somewhere around midnight, there was a violent earthquake that shook the foundations of the prison and everybody's chains fell off and prison doors swung open. So this man goes to his friend's house to borrow three loaves at midnight. This speaks of desperation, maybe even some anxiety. Nonetheless, it is the hour of reckoning. This man indeed is desperate to get these three loaves for his friend. It's desperate times. Desperate times caused with desperate measures. In other words, the man is interceding with his friend for his other friend. He doesn't get what he came for immediately, but he doesn't give up. He doesn't go away, but he keeps on knocking. He keeps on asking and he keeps on seeking. Then Jesus says this, he says, it's not because of friendship that the man gets up and gives him all that he needs, but because of his impotence. That's the importance of prayer, continued prayer. This is the only time that that word impotent is used in scripture. It's like the word lend in verse five. That's the only time that that word lend is used. It's not the typical word for borrow. But either way, the man gets up, gets out of his bed, and goes to his kitchen, and gets the three loaves of bread, gives them to his friend, because of his friend's persistent knocking, because of his friend's persistent asking. That is the same thing that our Heavenly Father will do for us because of our continual asking. Again, that's the importance of prayer. Continual prayer. In the passage, Luke chapter 18, verse 1 through 8, it says that Jesus tells a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. He said that a widow would come to a certain judge in a certain city and ask for justice against her adversary. But the unjust judge did not fear God, nor did he have regard for man. For a time he refused this woman. He refused this little widow. But she kept coming day after day after day after day. He finally realized that this widow is not going away anytime soon. So he decided to give her what she asked for. Give her justice before she wore him out with her persistent coming, her persistent asking day after day after day. Jesus said that if that unjust or unrighteous judge gave the widow justice, even though he neither feared God nor respected man, he gave her justice 
anyway. How much more will our Heavenly Father give us justice? Those of His elect who cry out to Him day and night. The bottom line is persistence. Keep on knocking. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on crying out to God both day and night in prayer. Believe that God not only hears, but that He also answers. Prayer is our link to the divine. It is our connection to our God. And when we connect with our God in the spiritual, He hears us and He will answer in the physical, but only if we belong to Him. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the what? The prayer of the upright is acceptable to Him. So I ask you, what about you? Are your sacrifices an abomination to the Lord? Or are your prayers getting through? Are they being answered? Is God hearing your prayer. Scripture says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and the Lord will hear your prayer. So, would you like the Lord to hear your prayer? What you got to do is to accept Him as Lord and Savior, and He will hear your prayer. And if He hears, He will answer. So, if you're ready to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, Here's what you do. Repeat this prayer after me and believe it in your heart and you will be saved. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. Help me to live for you. Give me the faith to believe for small things, for medium things, for large things. Help me to pray and not give up. Give me the strength to do what you've called me to do. And I'll thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I need you to do is to get a Bible. You've got to get a Bible, a physical Bible. And and highlight that those verses that are meaningful to you, those verses that encourage you. Learn those verses, commit them to memory. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. The other thing I want you to do is to find a Bible-believing church who believes in holiness, who believes in righteousness. Join that church, be discipled in that church. And like I said, when Jesus comes back, He'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. You'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever and ever. Well, I want to remind you that Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.